So I'd like to say welcome to the GAA's fifth webinar on synthetic diamonds. We're going to have the presentation for about 45 minutes. Then we're going to have a poll that you get to answer some questions about synthetic diamonds, and you're going to learn a lot tonight. And then we'll have our Q&A. I'd like to introduce Sarah Claire Edwards, who's one of the most recognised valuers in WA and recently valued the Perth Mint Pink Argyle collection, yes? Yeah, the discovery that... coin, yes. Fabulous. And John Chapman is also being very kind. John has been with Rio Tinto for over 30 years and recently retired from there to start his own business with synthetic diamond identification equipment and other equipment using optics is his specialty. So thankful for you guys coming in and doing all this work for presenting to us. I'm going to bow out now and leave it over to you. I'll come back after the video and to do the poll. Okay, well, the, the, the title I see has got synthetic diamonds and how to identify them, although that's sort of the main thrust of perhaps where which initiated this will also give a, a general discussion on the synthetics, a bit of the history, the production methods, and uh, Sarah will put in her two bobs worth on pricing, valuation, grading, and that sort of thing. But uh, just to kick things off, just from a historical perspective, um, oh, hang on, I thought we had this solved. We're trying to go on to the next slide. And uh, ah, voila. I can do that. That's why it's a team effort because. Um, Sarah's good at IT. But, uh, yeah, just um, so putting uh, synthetics in, into perspective, it was, it was 70 years ago when they were really, the developments were starting on them. And they then they uh, evolved over the subsequent decades. And it was really the, the HPHT ones which um, took a leading position in the market. And more recently, about 20 years ago, uh, the CBD technique came along. I should point out at this stage, some of these terms and will become clearer in the main presentation, which is in the video, but uh, I'll assume a lot of you have got some knowledge already, or a lot of knowledge, in fact, on uh, some of these terms. And really it's in the last so probably 10 years, which they've made a, quite an impact on, on the market. And as an example, it was only last year where India was exporting about half a billion dollars worth of lab grown or synthetic diamonds but at this point i'll so that gives you sort of just a why, why it's an important part of our industry and i'll uh, pass over to sarah now who will um, talk a bit more about the grading and the like hi everyone so i thought this evening that i'll just run through and talk a little bit about the terms so um at the moment sibjo is in the process with a draft where they're going through and creating um, the harmonised set standards and principles for what they're going to be doing with the laboratory working group and the terms that they're going to recommend. Uh, in our meetings in 2019, there was discussions uh, at SIBJO looking at terms that laboratories should be using and should be used within the industry uh, to protect the consumer. And those terms that they're looking at using is laboratory grown diamonds and laboratory created diamonds. They're looking at having no abbreviations, so nothing like lab diamonds. They're not looking at not having terms like synthetic diamonds, uh, not abbreviations like LCD or LGD, uh, just making it more standard. So the, the documents are in draft and I don't, haven't actually seen what's going to come, but uh, a lot of the laboratories you'll see have adopted this. Another thing for some people who aren't really in the diamond industry so much and who have come more over from gemology, uh, it's interesting when you're looking at a diamond where you, to describe a natural diamond, we don't actually use a prefix like we do when we're talking about, say, a natural corundum variety ruby or something like that. For a diamond, we just call it a diamond, which means it's natural. And any other prefix like laboratory grown diamond, that then would, um, would mean it's, you know, synthetic laboratory grown, even though it's grown in a factory. So over just to looking at certificates, I thought it's interesting to see what certificates are out in the market and what people are using. So HRD have a, are using a yellow certificate and they're using the term lab grown. So they haven't adopted that terminology yet of laboratory grown diamond. They call it 
laboratory grown on their certificate, but they laser inscribed the girdle of the diamond lab grown. And they put that number on the report as well, what they're lasering. Uh, they also follow the four C's when they're grading. Um, there is um, recommendations that you put LG and then the color or clarity grade. They're just using the color and clarity grades that they use for natural diamonds. IGI, they're also using a yellow grading report. Um, it's interesting here because on their uh, certificate, they call it, they laser inscribe laboratory growing. Whereas on their website, they write lab growing, but I, I believe they're using laboratory growing when they are um, certifying, certifying and laser inscribing a diamond. Uh, again, they, uh, they've got a yellow report and they're doing their same grading as they do for diamonds. GIA, they're doing it a bit differently. They're doing a blue certificate and their certificate has in big writing at the top, LGDR. And then they're also using the term laboratory grown and laser inscribing that on the girdle of the diamond. These reports are not hard copy reports like the natural diamonds, they're only a digital copy. And you've got two options with these. You can have plotted inclusions in their full report or you can also get their dossier where you don't have the plotting on there. And again, they're using the same scale as what they use for their natural diamonds. Another thing that's happening uh, that was discussed at SIBJO in 2019, November, is that customs codes. So the customs, it's, they're looking at making us have to declare synthetic diamonds when we bring them into the country. They're looking at adopting this in, tw in January 2022. Uh, and so this is basically um, SIBJO and JA had uh, been in touch with um, the Australian government and it's been approved this classification system. The idea is obviously to protect the industry um, and monitor the import and export of the synthetic diamonds. So you'll be using a customs eight digit HS code. So the H, we've already got HS codes for when you're bringing in um, diamonds that are rough or to comply with the Kimberley process. So sometimes I will work at Border Force looking and separating them to see if it's rough, if it's been sawed, if it's been bruted um, and so forth. So you can see here, there's a code HS7104.21. That's a synthetic diamond. It's been unworked or simply sawn or roughly shaped um, relating to a rough laboratory grown diamonds. Then there's another code HS7104.91, synthetic diamond otherwise worked relating to polished or worked laboratory grown diamonds. This is something that I will be updating as when it's definitely coming through as I'll be liaising with Border Force. I know that other countries are already using temporary codes and started to implement this. So already they are watching it in sections of Europe and also in India. So they'd be able to see the volume that's coming in and out. Uh, but we, I believe it's set for 2022 in January. And now, Pricing. So looking at pricing, this is one that you're going to see statistics that vary so much. And you'll see, say, like De Beers with their light box, that they've got really cheap pricing for their one carat stones. Um, these stones, I guess, about a decade ago, you were looking at higher pricing and, and they were coming in maybe 20% less than what a natural diamond was costing. Whereas to now it's it's more closer to kind of 60% cheaper than a natural diamond. So they're, they're over half the price. Um, they're less than over, over half the price less. Um, so if you look at this first chart, I've got these actually from the gem guide and they've been based um, from um, LD, LGDEX. So they're kind of pricing and data that they've collected. Uh, you can see here that Today, um, a 50-pointer FVS2 stone, uh, the average for a laboratory-grown diamond is 1,075, whereas today you can see that a natural is more like 2,850. These are, of course, uh, US prices. Uh, you can obviously read through the other ones there just to see that there is a, a difference, um, more than half, half the price cheaper. Uh, if we look here as well, this is just shows that obviously um, over, they have been decreasing in price. 
And you can see here that um, a 50 pointer, again, a D to F color in a VS, um, the synthetic or, or laboratory grown diamond was sitting in 2019 in the fourth quarter. You're looking at $1,050 to $2,250. Whereas now they've dropped a lot and it's you know, 600 to 1,450. And um, that's it from me. Now I'm gonna put you over to John and he will run over some instruments. This tends to be my area and um, all these will be, not all of these, but the movie that will be shown sh shortly will uh, have its main focus on the instruments and detection techniques. But I just want to point it out that there are many available instruments on the market based on different uh, technologies and different prices. So you can get anything from sort of five, six hundred dollars up to tens of thousands. And they both all have their pros and cons, depending on whether the stones are mounted or colored or whether it can detect imitations and sometimes their size limitations. Uh, so that just gives you, and there's probably more than that now. This I compiled uh, last year. As for the general characteristics that distinguish the three types, again, this is just a bit of a, a preamble and I'll be covering them in the movie. I probably should show this at the end, but I'm telling you them now, and then you can uh, look out for them in the movie and consolidate the learnings there. But uh, the HPHT ones and CVDs both have a, a characteristic of basically having no nitrogen if they're a colorless variety, which is the main ones, which are an issue on the market today. Uh, there's growth sectors, which is a, uh, the way they're grown are quite different and that can be revealed under uh, particular lighting and it shows the, the, what they call growth sectors in there. The um, strain within the stone can be seen as a, as a or birefringence, which can be revealed in cross polarizer filters, which some of you are familiar with. And that's quite distinctive between the three types of diamond. And then there are the inclusions within them where um, uh, the likes of HPHT will tend to have metallic ones. Now, unfortunately, I overlooked that in the movie you're about to see, so I mention it now because they are quite distinctive in uh, HPHT diamonds. They'll tend to be um, linear or metallic looking. Um, and uh, whereas CVD tends to have sort of black spots and natural diamonds will have, if any, sort of mineral inclusions in graphite. But uh, the other differences are sort of optical ones where uh, HBHT will phosphoresce. There's some distinct fluorescence differences, which uh, we'll, we'll get to in, in due course. And, uh, and spectroscopically, you can see different impurities that the synthetics and the naturals offer. Um, help. So I've just touched on these inclusions in the, the HPHT because they are overlooked in the in the movie. But the, in the summary of the uh, everything that's shown, essentially there are two growth methods: CVD and HPHT. Your synthetic colorless diamonds are type two; they have very little nitrogen, and you have a, a fluorescence characteristic that the natural ones have a long wave that's stronger than the short wave. And there's phosphorescence under the short wave will indicate synthetic. And because of those inclusions I showed earlier, you'll find that the HPHT can often be attracted to a strong magnet. As for the growth methods, the HPHT, for whatever reason, they tend to be very strain free. And uh, so you, no birefringence patterns are, are observed. That's regardless of color. I've already mentioned the inclusions um, and also the columnar patterns under cross polarizing filters for CVD. And for those who are able to go a bit in a bit more detail, sophistication, uh, which is what uh, more la labs are more inclined to do is look at uh, optical spectra of which there's some distinguishing lines for CVD and uh, well, particularly CVD, but also natural and uh, not so much for HVHT. So that's a summary of it. And uh, this is probably more used after the event, but you can ask for me later if necessary, but there's a bit of a flow chart of what techniques one can use uh, in, in incorporating the fluorescence and metallic, uh, I'm sorry, mag magnetism and the like. So there is a, a bit of a system there, which uh, uh, Branko's re refined to be a more elaborate looking chart there. 
But, uh, and when we come to the end of it, if you want to contact either myself or Sarah, there are the details. And there's some Instagram accounts there, which you, you must follow, of course. But uh, without much further ado, I say that's what's about to come. Some of that might make more sense later, but we'll now put you on to a movie which uh, Sarah and I went to great pains to make, which hopefully you can understand. And uh, we'll leave it over to you and we'll get back to you in 20 minutes because that's the length of the movie. I love the messages in Barchies. You know, I got all of these diamonds actually for buy last week. How much are they worth? Well, that depends on whether they're natural or synthetic diamonds. Like, as in a CZ or something? No, that's an imitation diamond. I'm referring to a non-natural diamond. Oh, yeah, I Non-naturally grown diamond. I read something somewhere. Was it a CBD diamond? CBD, ah yes, let me tell you about those. What's one of the methods of growing diamonds? Let me show you. There's, what you have there is, we have a chamber, usually made of glass. The air in the chamber is evacuated and a mixture of methane and hydrogen is introduced. The carbon in the methane becomes the building blocks of a diamond through an ionization process initiated by microwaves. The carbon deposits onto a diamond substrate and slowly builds a diamond plate layer on layer. So what's the hydrogen for? The hydrogen is critical to etch away any graphite that has formed because the pressure is near or less than atmospheric pressure where diamond is unstable. For growth in a diamond friendly environment, high pressure and high temperature conditions are employed the HPHT, which we referred to earlier. The heart of an HPHT system is a cell in the middle where the actual diamond grows. For that, there's a, a seed and a molten solution of um, iron or nickel or cobalt into which carbon is dissolved. Often this diamond source is, is actually diamond powder of a lower industrial nature anyway. That dissolves and uh, precipitates, migrates down and precipitates on the diamond seed and ends up growing the larger diamond. And this all has to be done under pressure and under high temperature. There are various ways of producing the pressure. In this instance, with two rams um, in opposite directions around a, a fixed what's called a belt here, but there are other methods such as with a split sphere and even a, um, a donut arrangement. A split sphere one is a popular one because it's a much smaller press and, uh, and therefore cheaper as well. Okay, I see. Well, really, that's great and pretty technical, but how are you actually going to identify these synthetics or whatever you call them? What toys do you have over here? Ah. Let me show you what we have. And they're not toys, they're instruments, by the way, Jill. Well, here they are. The multitude from the small to the large. We have a magnet, a cross-polarized filter, also known as a polariscope, a system for looking at the fluorescence and phosphorescence of a stone, and our latest piece of equipment, a spectrometer for looking at the absorption and the photoluminescent spectra of a stone. And one of the oldest pieces of equipment, or still of use to gemologists, a loop and a microscope for looking at the inclusions in a diamond. 
So what's this thing for? Ah, yes, that's a prototype. It's also known as a doublet buster. But we don't need that. I'll All right, that. well, let's just get it going, hey? Well, what have you got there? Show me what you've got. Oh, gosh. got these from a guy last oh, weekend. He's well, there's quite a bit here. What we'll do is, I see you've got coloured stuck diamonds as well. We'll leave those to later because... Oh, so they're definitely lesser. diamonds? I'll assume that they are. But I'll look at the colourless ones first. To see. Hey. Oh, sorry. Uh, he just gave it to me on the weekend and I've been wearing it ever since. He said I could sell everything. I'm just really after some cash. So what tests are you going to start with? We'll start with the fluorescence. That's the easiest test to use, for which we have two wavelengths, a long wavelength and a short wavelength, also called LW and SW. OK, we place the diamonds into a, a viewing area here. So, do they always fluoresce blue? Uh, most of the naturals will fluoresce blue, but they can come in a range of colours, depending on the inclusions in them, the defects, and also the colour of the diamond. As this chart shows, and also it depends whether they're synthetic, whether they're treated, or whether they're imitation, the C's edge you referred to earlier. I'll use my phone so you can see what's happening inside under this, but normally you can look through the eyepiece and uh, there's an app here which helps in viewing what we're looking at. So there's a short, a long wavelength and you can see there's the diamonds. Oh, they're glowing. They're all different strengths, aren't they? And they're a bit dusty as well, but the key here is to compare the long wave and the short wave reaction. So I can photograph the uh, long wave and then switch over to the short oh, wave. Oh, they've changed. So those ones almost have a bit of yellow. Well done indeed. And that's the sort of thing we're looking for. So I can take a picture of the short wave. And so then... those ones got fainter and those ones got stronger. Is that right? You're quite right. And we can confirm that with this... Uh, little comparison thing here which I can take it off now and you can see that some of them indeed are, are brighter in the long wave and dimmer in the short wave and they're the natural ones so this one here certainly is a natural stone and this one um, and looks like that one whereas these other ones here uh, are suspect synthetic diamonds these three at the top here. Will I still get lots of money for those ones? Well you won't get as much but I want to show you something else as well, which helps us uh, confirm the nature of the synthetic diamond. If I go back to what we were looking at, you might, oh, let's just go back one further. Uh, this is the short wavelength fluorescence. And you'll notice when I switch it off, two of them. Oh my gosh, you can see it glowing. That's what is known as phosphorescence. And you and didn't even need to take the, turn the lights off in here. Well, that's the beauty of this system. That, that the older ones, they needed that. Now, those ones that phosphorus are HPHT because by virtue of some of the inclusions that are in there. <laughs> okay, now we'll look at the melee. What's melee? Is that another type of synthetic diamond? Uh, no, it uh, relates to the size of the diamond. So small ones, usually a couple of millimetres in diameter. Mm. But the thing about the melees, if they're synthetic, they'll only be HPHT on the whole. Well, 99% of them will be HPHT because it's too, it's uneconomic to make them by CVD methods. So since we're only looking for the, whether HPHT or not, it's phosphorescence, which is the That the afterglow. Technique, the afterglow indeed. So um, I've got a bit of a tray here to help identify if any of them do glow. And uh, you might recall the uh, put it under the housing 
So I've actually got a, a melee version of that particular software. And uh, you can't really see the stones there, but when I switch the UV off, ah. Oh, wow. But that one's not glowing, is it? They all seem to be glowing. If we go back to what we had before, as you can see all of them there, I could record the pictures and compare them, but uh, it's... Uh, oh yeah, it is glowing. We can do the same comparison as before. And generally speaking, if someone's going to have synthetic diamonds in a parcel, there'll be unlikely to be one or two stones, but uh, either a, a large proportion. In this instance, they were all, all HPHT grown. Um, with the melee, because it's HPHT, the iron inclusions also mean that it might be magnetic. And we can test that with having a rare earth magnet and, and if they are, oh look, there we have an example of, of one of the ones that have been picked up. Um, there's another one as well. So that's not a definitive test, but uh, it uh, helps confirm that they are synthetic. Can a natural diamond have iron in it? It can, but they're very rare to find one that's that's magnetic. So Jack, can you use the magnet on the bigger stones? It certainly can. Let's try it on those ones we looked at earlier. You might recall, I think the ones at the top were, oh look, yes, certainly, that can one lifts it. it. And it's, see if there, you can see if there are any more. I got one. There's another method too, and that is to use cross-polarized filters, which look at the birefringence within a diamond. So natural mm -hmm. diamonds and CBD and HPHT both reveal distinctive patterns. Between cross-polarized filters, you can see a birefringent pattern representing the internal strain of the diamond. For CBD, it is a nice columnar pattern, whereas for HPAT there's no pattern at all. While for natural diamonds, that's what is called an anomalous birefringent pattern. These techniques are fine if one's dealing with loose stones, but when it comes to jewellery with mounted stones, the options are a bit more limited. Returning to our fluorescence instrument. I'll just look at this piece of jewellery of yours, nice pendant. Yeah, I don't know if I'll sell that or if I'll keep it, you know, because although my name's Jill, my surname starts with an S. Yes, well, that is a problem. Okay. Okay, we'll have a look at these. That's the long wave over to the short wave. Always do the long wave first in case something's phosphorescing. And uh, if we compare these, you'll notice that really most of them are all fluorescing brighter in the long wave, except the one that's questionable is up here. It's actually marginally brighter in the short wave. It's also a, a slightly yellowy, greeny colour. But we can look at that with another technique in a moment. We can also use this to look at rings. Um, this interesting one of yours with yeah, like green diamonds on the edge. This ring has a blue long wave fluorescence, which seems marginally brighter or quite or noticeably brighter than the short wave fluorescence. However, it's slightly concerning in so far as the long wave one is not your traditional blue you expect from a natural diamond. But we do have another technique for checking such stones, and that is to use spectroscopy. First, we'll look at a loose diamond, one of the ones we looked at earlier. So you're putting the CVD diamond in this toy, what's this called? The spectrometer. Uh, yes, I don't know if it's a CVD diamond, it's a, a diamond, one of those ones. Uh, it's one of the ones which came up as being suspect. And if we look at it under PL, which is to shine it with a, a laser, in this case 405 nanometers, it'll glow. I can probably show you quickly. Ooh. No. Probably can't because it's not very bright at all. Don't um, worry, I have my sunglass lenses. That's always good to be ready for safety matters. And you'll see this has produced a, a very strong peak at 738 nanometers. That's indicative of silicon and 
vacancies in the crystal. You might remember the description I gave on how CVD is grown. It's in a glass chamber usually, and that has silicon in it, and so some of that contaminates the CVD. But you can get in nature, so that's not definitive. But you can see two very small peaks here, which if I change the scale, there are two more peaks here. There's one at 678 and one at 542 nanometers, and they are from a nitrogen and nitrogen vacancy center, which is associated with CVD. So the combination of those three peaks means they are CVD. So I was right saying it was CVD. My guess was it was CVD because it wasn't magnetic and it didn't have, what's that thing called? That when Phosphorescence? You, yeah. Yes. So you've got this peak, this peak, this peak, and then you've got this one. Ah, well, you might remember when you came and you said, are they all diamond? Well, that's what's called a Raman peak, and it's specific to diamond and the wavelength of radiation. So it's at 430 nanometers on that, which is diagnostic of diamond. So all diamonds should show a peak with this system at that wavelength. Okay, we can look at this ring in the same initial... Um, PL mode, cover it up so we don't get zapped by the laser and turn it on. Now that um, silicon vacancy peak at 737 isn't always there and here's a CVD on, a ri on the ring and it shows those two peaks relating to the NV center. And there's the 430 again. Yes, that make you happy. So that is also a diamond as well. So you haven't been duped there, they all seem to be diamonds. We can also look at a diamond under absorption and uh, using that same one which was CVD, you can look at the absorption spectrum and that peak is also a strong absorption at 737 nanometers. So what's absorption? Are you putting a different light through or what are you doing there? This puts white light across the spectral range of almost in the ultraviolet into the near infrared because 737 is beyond the human vision so it's handy to have another method like this because the alternative is a spectroscope which you look through and see a spectrum and you can see lines there but it's a bit hard to see ones beyond the range of human visibility. So what's a natural diamond look like? Well in absorption I grabbed one of those ones we had there, you get a distinctive line over here. That's why you can see a, a peak there. Oh, so that's the line you were talking about before, 430? No, no, that's the Raman one. This is in absorption mode, and it's at 415, which is uh, due to three nitrogen atoms, which you'll only get as a cluster in a natural diamond. And you can also see it, should be able to see it, in PL mode. And that's where you should see the peak you're referring to, but it might be drowned. So I can switch over to that and turn it over to PL mode and we'll see what we've got. Ah, and there's that peak, same peak, but now it's an emission one at 415 nanometers. And, and the one, one I mentioned, that's the peak which uh, is tells you it's a diamond, although it is superimposed on perhaps another peak that's there. Then what's this one? Oh, that's all related to that 415. So that's, in fact, the blue you see when the diamond's fluorescing. Another spectroscopic technique uses infrared light. Such spectra show you details of the nitrogen. There's a region in the spectrum which shows the nitrogen here, along with the standard diamond one and a little hydrogen peak as well. This is a normal diamond, but then if we look at some other ones, for example, this one has a lower amount of nitrogen there, which is in a couple of states, A and B. I won't bore you with those details. But a third type has no nitrogen at all. You can see in this area where the nitrogen is supposed to be, there's no nitrogen. These are type 2 diamonds. So, Jack, uh, don't you have like a piece of equipment where you can just press a button and it tells you whether or not it's a natural or a synthetic? Yes, there are numerous systems on the market that are based on either fluorescence and phosphorescence or spectra. The devices are automated versions of basically what I've shown you. So another pop popular technique for low-cost devices is to detect UV transparency. 
How does it actually work? You see, colour synthetic diamonds are type 2. That means they have no nitrogen in them, just like I showed you with the infrared spectra earlier. And such diamonds, they transmit ultraviolet light. And also, 2%, about 2% of natural diamonds are type 2. So, so these ultraviolet-based instruments are very good as a screening device, but they're not foolproof on account of those um, other stones that will also show up as being synthetic, but actually they're not. So you need to do more testing than just rely on screening devices. And um, what about, you said you're going to do some testing on my pinks or those other coloured stones that I collected before? Yes, you can't use these, any of these instruments for colour stones on the whole, they're only for colourless. So for those colour stones, we have special cases and we'll have to look at that as a separate exercise because we'll also be looking at treatments as well as just how yeah, they grow and cool. could be natural yeah. and treated. Yeah, see. yeah. Um, I've really got to get going, yeah, okay. but I might want to learn more about it. It's quite interesting, but you know, it's pretty overwhelming. Well, ride safely. Thanks. See you later. So, our question and answers. When a jeweler's torch, I don't know if you had a chance to check yeah. that question. When a jeweler's torch heats up a diamond, if they're doing a retip, a synthetic diamond, there's been antidotal reports that the synthetic diamond changes colour. Uh, yes. Um, I was going to work through the list, but it doesn't matter. Um, you give me that question. Uh, CVD will change colour under heat and under UV. Uh, with UV, it's in danger of um, becoming is it darker or lighter, one or the other, and the heat does the opposite. Um, strangely enough, actually, under UV, it goes a darker colour, and under a torch, it'll go a lighter colour, but that's only a temporary colour change, and in normal daylight uh, or in an office environment, after about half an hour, it'll return to what it was. So I'd say that's the evidence. There's been... There was a, an, an article that the Beers wrote in Jensen Gemology a few years ago, and they looked at that phenomena. And uh, I, should, I suspect that's where the evidence, and I've noticed it as well, just under the jewelry inspector for CBD coated CZ, that tends to go. Yeah, uh, we brown. have those ones that went brown that <laughs> yeah. I wrote that, mm. yeah, that report on. We've got images of it. Which also means it could lend itself as a test. Yeah. CBD test, does it change colour? But it, it doesn't always happen and it can be quite subtle. When we first got diamond coated CZs, I brought them over here and had lunch with John and we put them under shortwave and we left them outside for the duration while we had a nice lunch and we came back and they... they okay? <laughs> I don't know if they've got back yet, but they hadn't, still hadn't got back after the lunch. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that might be a CZ specialty. <laughs> Excellent. No. John Burke is asking approximately what percentage of diamonds have short wave fluorescence? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Um, sometimes when it comes to whether a diamond's got fluorescence or not, a lot of it's got to do with how sensitive your equipment is. Uh, like certainly if we're talking about long wave, even though a lot of diamonds will be described as having none, uh, if you crank up the sensitivity, you can always detect usually something. Um, but with but generally speaking, in, in the absence of any high-tech, super sensitive equipment, probably in short wave, I would say probably 30% would have a noticeable um, fluorescence. But of course, it will be stronger when you go to the long wave. But it's, it's, it's usually visible there to some extent. Can I just add something in there? Oh, um, just with your PL inspector, mm. your jewellery inspector, actually. Because um, what I notice when I'm valuing is that a lot of GIA and other um ultraviolet uh lights but specifically yours because it must be that little bit stronger that when you get a, a diamond report that says no fluorescence i'm normally seeing faint when i see um faint i'm normally seeing medium so i've got to just be aware of what equipment and i've got all different light box like uv boxes that i can cross check and now i know um, but normally you're seeing a bit even if it says none on the reports thanks Helen is asking, is the price cheaper now as there are more laboratories and more diamonds available? 
Okay. I think that it's one of those things. If you look at um, De Beers, uh, who have come in with Lightbox charging US $800 for a carat, um, they're doing CVD diamonds and they're from VS Clarity up and they're doing a range. They're just, they're not telling you what colour you're getting. You're getting somewhere between a D and a J colour. So they've been able to do this obviously with volume and also mixing that colour range you're getting and the cut grade on it's good. And I think that obviously they've come in and kind of driven that market to kind of pull, obviously the technology's evolved, so the costs have got down, but also I think De Beers would be driving something with their light box a bit. What do you think? Yeah. Well, definitely, but um, there's each year there are more and more producers and the existing producers, a lot of them are expanding their capacity. So uh, given that there's more on the market, then the price pressures will inevitably drive the price down. And I believe the Chinese government bought into a lot of the equipment in China. So they were looking at more that um, some of the costs had got really driven down because obviously that laboratory is not having that to pay for all that equipment. Um, there's different beliefs if it's going to continue to drop or whether or not they're going to have to stay like for Malay at a certain price because of that cutting, because of the cost to keep cutting. So there's... Yes, that's the bottom, yeah. the bottom cost to be the cutting. Bottom cost, cost of the cutting, yeah. Yeah, they can't reduce that cost. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And while we're talking idea. about this, you asked before about, you know, are CVDs or HPHTs more expensive? And um, when I first went out and CVDs came out in the market, they were they were actually costing more than a HPHT. And I don't know um, specifically, I haven't gone through and done research looking at the two markets of the types of stones. But if we do look at that... Um, that you know, uh, De Beers Lightbox are doing the CVD diamonds um, that have a range of color, whereas you, you could probably sell a HPHT of a higher color stone, and there's probably not that such a comparison. So that's maybe why the price is easier to be sustained. Yeah, and also you could get maybe an excellent cut. I believe that AGS um, they won't, haven't been valuing for, um, haven't been certifying laboratory grown diamonds, but they're starting, they're doing it like a pilot run and they're going to be giving ideal and excellent cuts on synthetics. So who knows how that's going to affect things. In, in this Do we know if they're cutting all these synthetics to a really good cut? Are they still like some of the natural diamonds cutting them for weight rather well, than... Well, I don't, I don't... I don't believe it's in the same way for weight. I did read somewhere, but I don't quote me because I don't know exactly where it was, but uh, it's not just the, the rough because it's um, actually the, the volume in the laboratory, like the, the factories that are doing it. So I guess that they're getting a mixed standard coming out. But, and also when you don't have, De Beers are specifying that they're doing a very good cut. When other people, um, some stones are being mimicked for GIA certificates. So there's, um, you know, cutting exactly for a GIA cert and they're being sold together with that document. So you're getting a copy brought to you and it's, it's got those measurements. So because in Australia, we've got a lot of excellent cut stones, then for the bigger stones, there might be the drive to cut them. But for smaller stones, I think it's a bit mixed. I think Karina Tucci told me last week that, um, in a, that they're actually cutting some of the synthetics into the old antique cuts. Mm. Well, Scary. There's, yeah, for. There's, there's no reason why you'd cut um, a, a natural different to a synthetic in many respects. It's the same. The same people are doing it. It's the same factories in, uh, in India who are doing both. So it's, it's it's not a specialist area really. But in this discussion, the last few minutes, I just want to point out um, we've used the word laboratory, and this is why I don't like the word laboratory grown because in our industry, laboratory is also a gem lab. So when we talk about a laboratory, can, it can be confusing. We prefer to, factory, hey? Well, I think they're factory. Right. You know, these places, and they're not a lab. They're like a factory. They've got backup generators. You were there so with me in Israel, weren't we? We were there looking at all that equipment. Anyway. And couldn't take any photos. Uh, yeah, oh, I think... I we did, did you see the cross polar filters up there? Those pictures, they were from that lab. Yeah. Not of the equipment though. Mm -hmm. uh, Helen, I think meant, meant to say factories or she was referring to factories when she said laboratories. Uh, are there any CVD diamonds uh, that can be magnetic, Isabella? Yeah. Isabel yeah. is asking. Yeah. The answers are clear, no. There's no way you can get iron or cobalt or nickel into a CVD. 
And we're just asking more about the notes being downloaded and we're going to organise something about that. And yes, it's being recorded and you just need to email publicity at gem.org.au um, to ask for a link to the webinar recording. Uh, Ralph is asking, how does the hardness compare? They, 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 I'm assuming yeah, between they, synthetic they, diamonds and natural diamonds. Yeah. I mean, you hear odd reports sometimes, but usually it's um, a synthetic producer trying to push his product and say they're harder than natural. Um, and uh, But really, uh, essentially, they're the same structure and there's no reason why one should be harder than the other. Uh, and uh, so I would say no, that they are no difference and they are indistinguishable from a hardness point of view. Have has anybody tried to add inclusions to mimic natural ones? Uh, yes, I know that. I think that's being being muted. It'd be uh, it'd be hard to do. You certainly probably couldn't do it with um, CVD and and even with HPHG. Could you add them? Not really. Uh, but that would be one one way which producers would be. In, in, in trying to develop if they could, because that'd be one way of cheating the system, because looking at inclusions is a, often a very good way of doing it. Liz Stevens asks, why is there a huge variation in the retail market price from 3,000 versus 10,000 for the same 1.46 F VS stone? Well, it would go, come down to the market. So different stores have different overheads, um, different staff. What do you think, is that, Katie um, Wyatt? Is, is that comparison of synthetic diamonds? Or just, is this a general comment on, um, uh, is the 3K a HPHT and the 10K a natural? Um, no, I've got to assume that she's asking that price, Liz, um, for synthetics, why is the synthetic oh, sold yeah, between right. three and ten thousand for the same type of stone in the market? Well, there's uh, a variance in price depending on where you're. I'm more familiar with the overseas market, but in saying that, I've been overseas for a little while. Um, you know, compared to the local market, and it depends what branding that wholesaler would be selling with their diamond, and what they might have a recommended retail markup, or the store might have their own markup. So I think that. I'm down. just wondering where Liz got that information. Was that from one of your PDFs that went up? No. No. Okay. So it's I didn't put any retail pricing up. Is, sorry? I didn't put any retail pricing up. No. So maybe this is just the same for natural diamonds. You can go into a store and get it for 3000 and mm -hmm. somebody else, Tiffany or Cartier, will charge you 10000 for the same thing. Branding, marketing, depends if you're paying for carpet and curtains and a good street or, you know. Well, well, well I think even at, well, with synthetic, some retailers, where well, they do it now, I'm not sure, but certainly a few years ago, they would talk up the synthetic and say it's better than the natural and uh, it's charged the same price as a natural. I've had colleagues um, being offered synthetic several years ago at the same price as a natural, so... I do believe the markup can be um, very rewarding when it comes to uh, laboratory grown diamonds. That's what I've heard. Um, very generous markups. Uh, Gabrielle, CVD stands for Chemical Vapor Disposition. Uh, Serena is asking, what's the app called in the video for the fluorescence? Uh, well, it's the, I'll let you answer that, John. Okay. Uh, it's called uh, ge Geometrics. And it's free. And it's good because it creates a file on your phone just for those stones. So when I am creating PowerPoints and looking back over, I have a whole library of fluorescence images. So it's it's, it's really handy and easy to work it with. It is very handy for lots of different things. And it's just an app on the phone and you download it from the App Store. Um, whether you've got a, an iPhone or an Android, it's, be, it's better on uh, oh, the, the Android works. See, it's got a little diamond mark on it. it disappeared. And it's free. 
Uh, back to the question. Sarah needs to go to Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We'd like to keep her here. We need. I her. went to Hollywood High School. <laughs> Seriously? Yeah. Um, can one use? I never know whether to believe you or not. Sometimes. I did. Can one use unseparated UV light to check phosphorescence of HP HT diamonds with a small, cheap torch, not long wave versus short wave? That's yeah. from Frank. Right. So, okay. so uh, no, the small cheap torches, they're all LW and it, it's very rare to get LW to induce any phosphorescence. But you can... Uh, on that note, I've noticed some things that um, Grant Pearson, some instruments he's bought from China and they say things like this is such and such wavelength and he's tested them and they're not. Um, a lot of these UV things that are supposed to kill the virus and they're supposed to be, I can't remember the number, say six, seven, eight nanometers or whatever, but they're nowhere near it and they're not going to do the product. So they're not going to do what this product says it will. So I found different things coming out of China. You have to really double check that they are what they say they are. Mm. That's fine. Um, one more thing, Frank, if you do have a torch and you want to even check that um, long wave, how it's working, you can bring it into class next week and we can just have a look at compare different light boxes. But you won't from long wave get your phosphorescence. But, but there, there is, a, I have come across some HPHT ones, I don't know what it is about them, but uh, they actually phosphoresce just from white light as well. That um, I've, I've put them in the dark. And do you have any? I've got one, I bought one for that purpose. It's, it's an orange, it's just a, a weak orange glow, but it's there and it lasts for ages. Frank, we'll have show and tell next week in class. I'll bring it in. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna move this along because we're going over time. So there are a few very misleading ads going on at the moment with synthetic market. For example, Novita Diamond says, gemologists can't tell the difference. Does anybody have a problem? Does anyone else have a problem with that statement? Well, we're not anybody, but um, that's probably a Well, maybe one some gemologists can't. Maybe they need to come and do some diamond grading. Yeah. Um, but and yeah, it, it, isn't a great, it isn't a great slogan out there because obviously we are trying to promote um, having people who are educated in, in the field and we want um, people to come in asking for a gemologist when they come into a store. Well put. If a magnetic picks up a diamond, can we conclude it's HPHT given CVD and naturals do not have metal in metal conclusions? I, I think it's fair enough. To, I, I think it's fair enough to conclude that, but I just say it with caution because I have read that uh, look some naturals might have a bit of iron in them or something. So uh, I'm. I personally never come across them, but uh, I think you'd be 99.9% .9 confident that it is, but I can see- What Sarah's about a type two B blue diamond? Boron's not magnetic. Okay, great. So- uh... <laughs> There was something and I looked at. Swore, no, I swore we had one natural, I don't know which stone, we had one natural in the lab that was magnetic. And right. I don't know what color it was. Maybe it was blue, I don't know. Back uh, in the day. Exception to the rule. But and Newman, be, if, if I can say, if when you're polishing and it's got cracks in it, you could get iron from the polishing wheel to oh, get in there. That yeah. might be, but it'd be great. We could be able to pick it up, I don't think. And Newman's asking if she can have the correct answers to the um, poll. And if you just email publicity at gem.org.au, I'll email you the printout and the answers. I can't do it from this Zoom. Uh, okay. Gerard is asking, I just asked that, didn't I? Helen, do all colourless HP, HT and CVD diamonds have phosphorescence? Uh, no. Uh, well, certainly CVD ones, most of them don't. And of the HP, HT, I'd say probably 90% do, but I, uh, I have seen some from a particular manufacturer who had, where they had zero uh, fluorescence heard, and phosphorescence. I heard they were working on how to knock it out. Mm, right. Yes. So at this stage, you just have to still be careful, Helen. 
it's an indication. Uh, Gina, the instrument's going to be on the um, the GAA website shop, and I'm not quite sure of the price. I think it's around 600 plus GST. Um, I'm not quite sure, but you have to check the shop shortly. Uh, hang on, and Gina's asking about the Inspectrum, which won't be available from the shop. Oh, well, I beg your pardon. So I thought she just missed named it the inspect was the the spectroscope wasn't it yeah, that's right so better, better speak to me directly on that one it's a bit more expensive than <laughs> quite a bit more expensive than uh, the jewelry inspector and i don't think they'll be having it in the shop but uh, do we roughly yeah. know how much because there's more questions on that is there oh i see what price um don't do yes. scan to email you under Chris? five thousand <laughs> Under 5k. Email John, Chris. I think that'd be a good idea. Uh, I'm not quite sure what Glenn's saying. What will it do to natural prices? Ah, okay. Synthetics. Do we? How's your crystal ball on what it's going to affect? I think there's a lot of things that are going to affect natural prices, like a pandemic. Uh, so it's hard to know. Glenn, do you guys have any opinion on that? Well, I would say you could look at, for example, the emerald or other markets, gem markets, and ask, well, what effect did the synthetics have on that? And uh, I think probably it didn't in those well, instances. Well, that's what we looked at, is that if you look at, like, say, a, a royal blue Burmese sapphire, um, or a royal blue, um, yeah, a Burmese sapphire, that those are holding price. Whereas if you look at the bottom market, where there was more other, like, the newy synthetics in, maybe that affected that for a little while. So I would say that I don't think like the coloured market or the top end would be affected as much as the more mid and lower end. But that's what do you think, Catherine? Value on? I'm trying to read the questions. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, I think you've answered it very well. Okay, great. Well, I think that none of us really know. And I think that it, it, it's an interesting thing with these these synthetics that have been coming down and, um, you know, obviously if people, they were at one of the talks I went to overseas um, with Amaz, um, the head of Amazon Jewelry, she was talking about the millennials are moving to, um, to uh, looking at buying coloured gemstones and they want a luxury story with it. And so they're liking the fact that some people are promoting this as ethical and things like that. So what they were suggesting at the ICA Congress was to, for the synthetic market, um, they didn't see it, or no, no, at Sibjo or one of them, and they were talking about how it, it is another market. It's not going to knock out that, it's another market. They're moving to something else anyway. Um, so is it the generation that are gonna change what they're doing? Okay, we've got lots more questions, so mm -hmm. I'm gonna move them right along. Yeah. Um, the rare earth magnet, what is the cost of one of them, John? Oh, about $2. Daryl's, I think you can get them pretty much anywhere, can't you? Yes. John? Uh, actually, no, it's surprising. I've, where do you go? I'm not sure. I, I get mine um, if I have another, another product that needed them. So um, I, but, but I've got a few here, for example. So um, maybe oh, good. I lost if, if, mine. if somebody's <laughs> in need. Ralph, to, you'll have to ask the NCJV if they've got I'll, different... I'll throw them in with the jewellery inspector. How's that? Oh, really? <laughs> okay. Uh, the email address for the recording is publicity at gem.org.au. Uh, Ralph, you'll have to ask for the synthetic diamond prices from the NCJV. Uh, publicity at gem.org.au. Monique? Uh, There's a question there from Mark Seddon, I can't see, he wants to know what the material is, it's called pyrophyllite, uh, as a seal in the in the press. Um, tell the question, because not everyone's just can I see, see the question. Says, John, yeah. on the HPHT diagram, what material is used for the seal between the belt and the top and bottom press of the crucible? Uh, yes, there's a bit of an interesting story about that, because py the pyrophyllite is actually a natural material. Uh, I think it must be a bit like an asbestos so that it can withstand the heat and it's all compressible. It's like a gasket, you might say. Um, and they only find that in a few places. And one of them was a farm in 
Africa when Cecil Rhodes, I think it was him, any one of those early diamond pioneers, he said, right, I've had enough of diamonds, I want to get out of this, I'm going to go farming. So he bought this farm and, and, and it turned out that that was where pyrophyllite was, <laughs> there was a deposit of pyrophyllite on it, so he, he couldn't totally get away from diamonds. Okay, uh, do they have the same scintillation? Jill Penn is asking as real diamonds. Depends how it's cut. But yeah, I mean, there's, they're indistinguishable from a property's point of view. So if they're cut the same, they don't have the same scintillation. Yes. Although I'll just put in there that with CBD diamonds, you sometimes you can uh, see a sort of like a graining with them. I don't think that affects scintillation, but it, it, it is, I suppose, something which can be visible and I've known heard of and I can believe it because I've seen a photograph there's some people who can just look at a diamond and say it's CBD because of the, when you know what to look for. Are there any Australians making synthetic diamonds? No. Not anybody, that we know of. If, if anybody wants to I can um, put them in touch with uh, <laughs> suppliers <laughs> of the equipment. <laughs> um, I strongly I'm just um, why the cobalt in HPHT diamonds from Frank? Now, the answer for that is, well, both, co strange enough, cobalt, iron and nickel are solvents for carbon. And, uh, and, and uh, yeah, so you can dissolve the carbon in it. And uh, yes, interesting, those three, three elements are also the ones that are magnetic or attracted by a magnet. Uh, I saw a question there from Jan, she asking, can the inspection be used for gems other than diamond they certainly can it, it can be used for um well um i haven't had much experience with it but uh, certainly your sapphires and rubies and even jade um it can be used for um and hmm, yeah any, any gem that can either has a characteristic fluorescence or absorption lines somewhere in that region of 400 to 760 nanometers Right? Yes. Someone else has asked that question too. Mm. Well, I finally found it. Thanks, Sarah, trying to make my life easier. <laughs> um, this one for you. Okay, well, that's a statement, so it's not a question. Mm -hmm. Brilliant cut. I don't know what Jill Penn's asking with a brilliant cut, but. Um, a lot of the stones are being, a lot of them are being cut for brilliant cut, but as Katie said before, some are being cut um, as an old cut and they're doing all sorts of cutting. If the short wave no, for me, so if for you, a short wave UV light, what kind of eye protection should be needed to use it? Well, it depends what instrument you're using, but if you're using a jewelry inspector, um, then there's actually a filter before the eyepiece that will block out the UV. So you could just go for a flip pair of sunglasses like mine, really, Gina. Um, I've done that. Strong magnet. Don't know what question is there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, we come to the end of it then. Is that the end? I think so. We might have missed some. We're just trying to go back up and I'm texting oh. in some things. Um, I think most of them. Um, yeah, I, I think we've we've covered them and sorry to anyone we haven't. If we've missed your question, if you could just uh, let us know right now and we'll have another minute and answer your question. Isabella Johnson has asked, are synthetic diamonds being still being marketed as being better as they are conflict-free. Well, that's yes, a... They are, well, they are being marketed. No, being, well. I, read, I read an article and um, it was saying that some have dropped that advertising and they're just because it is uh, controversial and some are still finding that their sales, they just come in and show them two stones and there's less advertising with it and they just pick natural or synthetic based on kind of prices and things. Um, but I believe there still is some advertising. And not only, well, well some will also decide to conflict free, they'll also be arguing that it's uh, more environmentally friendly. With backup generators. Well, just 
and they lots of they, equipment. They don't have to dig up the <laughs> earth. <laughs> yeah. So but they do need a very big constant source and they need a lot of electricity. Um, so yeah. depend on where they get their electricity from yeah. and they need a very good supply so it doesn't interrupt the microwave yes, process, yeah. my understanding too. Yeah, Gina yeah. Um, is also asking if I have a short UV light, what kind of eye protection no, should I, I get in order to use it? I've answered that. We've answered probably, that. You probably weren't paying attention, Kate. <laughs> and did you answer the one about the gem pen? No. Uh, what do you test with okay, the gem pen? What kind of technology they use for it? Okay, yes, the, well, the, the nice. gem, no, uh, well, he, he sells it. The, yeah. the gem pen is a um, great big fat pen, um, but that uses ultraviolet of different wavelengths, sort of quite short as well. So um, it goes shorter than the short wave that, for example, um, the jewelry inspector uses. So they, I think they have about three or four wavelengths which makes the test not uh, straightforward. You have to sort of put filters in and select the right one. But it works, it's good. It's a question for you as well, John, from Julie. Um, can the app be used with any shortwave, longwave light box? In, in principle, it can be used with any two photographs you want to, to compare. You can take a photograph of your kitchen before and after. It, um, it, it, it doesn't really matter. Corinne is asking about the opinion of your footprint of synthetics. Well, again, what we were saying before, the footprint of synthetics, it really depends on whether they're using solar or wind or gas or um, coal for their electrical source, yes? Depends how they're asking the question. They're talking yeah. about the footprint in terms like of a, a carbon factory. footprint, or they're talking about the foot footprint as in the fingerprint, oh. which is... No, no, I think the footprint or could be the real estate. Oh. How big is the factory? Is that, is that what she's referring to? How much energy it consumes. Oh, okay. Well, that's, um, right. that's, um, well quite a lot is the answer to that. Uh, oddly enough, though, with CBD, their biggest uh, cost factor isn't the power, it's the, it's the gas. Because they're pumping a lot in and mm. sucking it out, they, so they consume a lot of gas. And it has to be, high, it has to be very pure. Uh, Stuart Cole's written here that both conflict um, and environmental claims have been dropped. Seems Sibjo Natural Diamond Council and lab groups seem to have come to an arrangement. Well, okay. um, there are independents who are still advertising with these slogans. This is something that Sibjo has created in 2018, a laboratory uh, diamond grading working group um, that is another committee um, that uh, works with the diamond committee. And um, as I said, they're working on documents. They're in a draft state at the moment. So hopefully we'll have some guidelines coming out really soon. We'll wrap it up there. Thank you guys so much. That is so appreciated. All the hard work that went into that. We really do appreciate it. And we're looking forward to the next one. Thank you all for staying for so long. Um, hope you had fun, learned something. Please go out forth and tell everybody um, about gemology and about our courses because you are our best um, advertisers. Word of mouth is the most important advertising for the GAA. So we rely on you guys to chat away, have a nice conversation, have a cup of tea or something. And even just the intro courses are really interesting to people to get the bug. And you know how passionate you are about it. So it's time to share the fun, share the love. Thanks guys, really appreciate it again. Looking forward to the next one. No, oh, give us a bit of time. Everybody. <laughs> Stay safe. All right. Wash those hands. Look, no things. Washing hands all the time. So take care. Right out. Stay safe. Sorry about the glitch in the early days. <laughs> Thanks. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm. Let me just keep rolling in.